So I work at the University of Cambridge, and we don't pay attention to league tables. So there are various different ways of ranking things. But my team has just um, won some awards for best social media, best YouTube at the university, and best YouTube international presence, which is nice. Go team. And I guess that a part of that is really to talk about websites and content and what in our team, the digital team, we actually focus on, which is mostly this sort of stuff, filming things, taking photos of things, tweeting, trying to work out how you can talk about quantum theory in an Instagram post, that sort of thing. <laughs> but this is where we work. This is a, a photo we took with our drone last week. <laughs> um, this is our um, chief financial officer <laughs> talking to, um, I don't know, I'm just talking out some rubbish. <laughs> that, was, that photo was taken in the 15th century. And the point is, people sometimes say, can we come and look at your, can we come to your campus? Can we, we want to film on your campus, please. I go, well, all right, okay, well, it's like a medieval city, and there are 31 colleges that are all separate legal institutions, and then we have the university, which is the bit where I work, and there's about 256 different departments, within which there are thousands of staff and students, and they all have the right to say whatever they want, do whatever they want. So that's, that's what happens at universities. That's why universities are great places. But it also means if you're talking about optimizing systems to make things easy to do, or do simple things like make a logo appear in the same place wherever you're looking at the university, it's quite difficult and actually you might want to think about whether that's even necessary or not. Well, my first job there, I've been there for about 10 years now, they wanted me to roll out some web templates which were largely geared towards making sure that the logo went on the top left-hand corner, which is good, and we'll look at some logos in a minute because I'm from the marketing side of things, so that's what we do. Um, but this is really what people think about when they think about our institution. Gandalf and old buildings <laughs> and we we have a lot of success with Gandalf and his ilk and old buildings which is why Instagram is great for us and YouTube is great for us but it's also why we don't necessarily have a marketing department because we're not really flogging things but what we are trying to do is make sure that we do that contribute to the society Oh, sorry. Contribute to society <laughs> through the pursuit of education, learning and research at the highest international levels of excellence, which is great. So everything we do, like choosing a content management system, that's probably somewhere in the objectives. <laughs> so, you got, I mean, it would be. If, if we put out a pitch, even if we're wanting somebody to probably build a fence or something, you've got to think about this aspect of it. We're, we're very much driven by, in, in all seriousness, we're getting paid to help the university do that. And that, which is trying to make sure that people study at the university if they're bright enough. Making to Megan's point about diversity, wherever you're from, whatever your background, it's really important that you come to study there. So we're not trying to market the place, we're trying to change perceptions of the place. Because it is still a little bit like that. And we have, a, we have Gandalf, which is great. So yeah, previous Vice-Chancellor, the one that had some ideas about the existing website. There is no right background for Cambridge. That's the Tour de France when it popped through Cambridge, which is a sort of suburb of France, as everyone knows. <laughs> so we can't control that situation. We've got to give control to all those colleges, departments, academics. I'm not in a position to tell anybody in the university what to do. I have to influence their behavior. This is my 11-year-old on a climbing wall last weekend. So we turned up. We'd never really used it before. I had to have a quick assessment to see whether I was a responsible adult or not, <laughs> despite the fact I had a living 11-year-old to partly prove it. Um, so they just have lots of colored things. And you choose a route based on the colors. Really simple thing on the wall that says, if you're a little bit shit, just use the white ones. <laughs> If you're just sort of mediocre, use the yellow ones, etc., and go on and go on. And just such a great interface. We could work it out straight away. The pads at the bottom were about that 
I don't know if anyone's been on this sort of bouldering thing before. The pad's on the floor about that deep, and you just sign a thing saying that you are aware that you will die anyway <laughs> because of those pads. And so, yeah, you sign that, and off you go. He worked it out straight away because it's just very easy to use. He'd never been to anything like that before. Um, so like as a user interface, one sheet of A4 on the wall that said white, very easy, yellow, easy, etc., etc. Off he went. And he's still alive, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> so how do we make sense of that kind of chaotic situation of a place that we can't tell what to do, but we want them all to do things in the same way? These are social media guidelines. I'm going to talk quite a lot about social media because that's where most of our content creation efforts go. <coughs> and some of the pages on our website will probably show that. We've definitely got areas on our website that need more love. And we've put a lot of love into social media. So all those departments wanted to be able to create stuff. They said, how can we do it in a way that's, that's sensible? So uh, our original social media guidelines were, <coughs> um, <coughs> <laughs> don't be a dick <laughs> that was it and I was told we need something a bit more substantive that we can take to people's managers so that they realize that it's an official channel that we want to adopt so then we came up with be appropriate if you're going to be in a space in a social media channel behave in the way that other people on that channel are behaving otherwise you've just gate crushed a party and you're being weird you've put on some bizarre acid jazz like the stuff we were playing last night and it's they were into it as it happens but it doesn't always work out like that be creative if you're going to put your efforts into it do something that shows how your institution is different so even if you're going to put all that effort into a content management system if you're putting it into it then there's no point you've got to make sure that what you're creating at every stage says something about your institution is creative and be a good host uh, if you're going to put out content about your students or your staff, we've put a lot of stuff out about LGBT History Month, which has been fantastic, getting students talking about their experiences. But we only, depressingly, we still have to put that stuff out on Facebook where we know we're going to be there to moderate comments that come in. Because there are still dickheads out there. So, being a good host means if you're going to have any comments open on any of your platforms, we think you should be there to moderate that so that if people come looking for a way into your institution, they see a space that is open and tolerant. So that's really important for us. That last bit is probably where most of our efforts go on social media, is monitoring stuff and trying to make sure places are safe places. <coughs> you can download those if you want, CAMAC UK slash social media guidelines, which will give you a better idea about our approaches to social media. Um, so these are all the various channels that we create content for. You notice I haven't mentioned websites yet, but this is predominantly we're looking at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and YouTube. Facebook and Instagram for potential students. Um, Twitter really for journalists, or where you would expect to find the official word of the university, I guess you could say. And then YouTube is video. Although we do have a university video hosting platform, it turns out quite a few people look for video on YouTube. Who knew? Um, the middle column is channels that we don't use that often, but we have a presence on them. We have presence on a lot of social media channels. Going back to that, the one of Megan's slides showing the, and I don't, I don't if, if headless means you, you're, you have a presence in lots of different places, not just a single website. I'm not, right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, Good. <laughs> yeah, I was making lots of notes. So yeah, we have that, We're de and we are definitely all over the place. So. We have to make a presence on social media channels even if we're not going to use them so that other people don't steal our brand. So that's actually, there's quite a management issue in managing presences that people aren't even going to find. So that's like, how do you manage invisible content that doesn't even have an audience? So that, those are the sorts of things that come along. On the right hand side we've got Vimeo issue and Cinewebo. Um, we're about to start a WeChat channel in China as well. And so we need to think a lot about... If most of our content is getting born in the social media space, not on the website, and then it gets embedded in the website, 
At the moment, we've got a lot of video that goes straight onto Facebook. And although it might be stored on a drive somewhere within the university, at the moment it's not easily grabbable and reusable somewhere else. So we have got some integrations in Drupal with YouTube and things like that. But Facebook video, I guess they want to keep you within their platform. We're finding that more and more that the social media channels demand a bespoke version of that content for the different channel if you want to get the most out of their various algorithms and things like that. So that's what, as head of digital, that's the sort of thing that I um, keeps me awake at night is how, how can we justify the number of hours that the staff are using to create a piece of content based on how far it's going to go, whether it's actually going to change people's perceptions or not. So then we also have 4,500 websites, probably, and 4.5 million web pages, probably, um, which is the what the f <laughs> And that's why. Because <laughs> they will all say, you could talk to any of those departments about how they could be helped by people, experts like Jamie, who's here, and the Drupal team at Cambridge, or user experience people about the best way of looking at humans and how they use websites rather than code sanitizers. We've come from a long, yeah, in the past, you could look at a website and it would pass all sorts of accessibility tests because the code was written in a particular way. But the language used on the readable page was incomprehensible. The site navigation was incomprehensible. And you sort of think, well, why are we putting so much effort into the code if you've just made your entire website inaccessible? Because you're writing absolute bullshit. So we, and this is where our team is responsible, because Drupal has made the back-end technical side of things much easier for us. It's exposed where we need to improve content. So this is where we started. That's 1997. This is from the way back when machine. So that's when Dolly the Sheep was claimed. So that, that's the sort of thing that we're talking about content. That's the sort of thing we need to talk about. Uh, just, I'm just sort of drinking it in, really. Because there's a lot of things I like about this website. It's responsive, <laughs> which was very forward-thinking of it, wasn't it, in 1997? Well done. Uh, it thinks about a couple of user groups, I guess. It talks about the Cambridge area, and it talks about the university as a thing, and then finding information. I once took a link to Google off our homepage, and an academic phoned me up and said, you've broken the internet. I can no longer use it. I said, like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, I can't, it doesn't work anymore. How can I search the internet? I said, what do you mean? It's like, well, because here's how you use the internet. You go to the university's homepage, you click on Google, and then you search for stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you see the, 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 the bar bit at the top where you type the address in. Have you ever typed Google in that? <laughs> no? <laughs> so he did that, and then I taught him how to use bookmarks. And he was like, <laughs> And he was probably doing gene sequencing or something like that. But the point is, we've got a lot of legacy content that's on a page because users' journeys are used to it being there. And sometimes you've got to teach that user how to find it somewhere else so that you can knock it off the page. This is progress. We've got some colour now, which is nice. This is one of my predecessors probably thought we need to make it more vibrant. Let's put some blue on it. 2000, AOL bought Time Warner for $162 billion. I don't know what that means. I just thought it's tech-related. might be interesting. The logo is now on the right-hand side. What a relief, because it's much more powerful over there, don't you think? Uh, and we have a photo. Here. <laughs> when we were, yeah, it's broken, but that was, it was broken in the past, so that's all right. I have been to a lot of presentations to the broader university community about what we're trying to do with the internet, ideally communicate to humans, 
And one of my favorite quotes from one of them was, there is no place on the internet for images. Let's just leave it there. It's like, why are you putting images on our website when all we need is text? Which for their department was right, because they were sort of advanced mathematics. So they want a website with no images on it, because they get in the way. So just think about that. Progress. The Human Genome Project is completed in 2003. We've now got two photos on the home page, which is making it slower to load. Um, I don't think it's responsive anymore. I think it might be a fixed width. We've also moved, we've got information for, which is nice. We're telling the users who they are over here. And then we've got information about the university there. Now, these wouldn't have been in content management systems. This would have been hand-coded HTML. So if anybody from a communications team, if we even had one then, which we might not have done, um, wanted to get something changed, they would have sent a word file probably to a computer officer who would have gone, oh God, not Word. Copied it, pasted it into a text file, made it look beautiful, put it up there. But the whole news agenda for us, we have to now react to things within about 15 minutes before we put a university reaction to something out there. So it wasn't really working. Um, this is what the website looked like when I arrived, or that, that was the new template that I then had to kind of roll out with a lot of people's help. And that's a kind of a fixed width. It might have flexed a little bit, but pretty soon after that, although we got more images, the main thing was, well, we're trying to engage students, we're trying to share research with the world, we're trying to engage with businesses and things like that. But that's really when social media came along. So a lot of my effort, because it was proving very difficult to get everybody to adopt a template in an institution where you can't tell people what to do, we use social media quite a lot at that point to, to connect with those audiences rather than the website. So a lot of the copy from that, the pre that site would have been pasted into that one, which kind of ends up like that in a way. We've got a stack of websites in the middle that have all got bits of text, photos, videos, bits of audio, and the university communicating all sorts of messages. And then suddenly, in, during that kind of period of time, you've got other presences that represent the university, which I guess is like the kind of headless idea. And they're all taking bits of that content from that central website, but sticking it out on other platforms and other conversations are happening on all of those. And it's all coming back into the middle. So suddenly we, had a, we didn't have a website that represented the university. We had thousands of websites, thousands of different social media channels. And at the moment we don't really have a single, there isn't like a mother brain that knows all of that. There are hundreds of people around the university that have got various different bits, and we use things like search engines to find out what's going on. We use Twitter to find out what's happening in the university, as well as meeting with people. So we, we <coughs> put up this project in 2012, principally, again, to try and make things look consistent, but also to make our websites work on mobile phones and tablets and TVs and all those sorts of things just like the website used to in 1997, before, before people started messing with it. So we went into a consultation process. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's seen any of <coughs> Bosch's paintings in real life. They're, yeah. yeah. Have you seen this one? Is that, I've seen the Prado, I think. In, is it? Yeah. How big is it? Um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's not huge, is it, for no, the no, amount of detail that's in there? which is often what happens when you write a little project document. Uh, let's redesign a website and get a content management system. I want you to give me lots of money for that, please. All right, can you describe it on two sheets of A4, please? <laughs> which is difficult, because you miss a lot of detail, which Bosch didn't. Um, let me you, you go back. If we look at our plan that we wrote for that project, that, that's another plan, that's, that is the plan. Has anyone been to Cambridge? Cool. So there's a river that goes through it called the Cam, and the bit of the river that goes past a lot of the colleges is called the Backs. And so this was a design by a gardener called Capability Brown, where he was saying, here's how we're gonna lay out all the lawns behind all of our colleges. 
which I just found this the other day in the, in the university library on their website. I wasn't actually going to leave my office. <laughs> I do. It's a unified vision for a shared space that goes across all those different legal institutions. I haven't found many other examples of that since then. <laughs> but I thought it was quite interesting. Presumably, that I, I, I kind of want to go back and find out how did they get that agreed, that they were going to all look after their gardens in a particular fashion. It's like if you can sort your bushes out and your grass, you say, they'll say, they, who's going to watch this? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> bit late now. <laughs> We're different. We're different. So we accept that there's a central content management system and a central website and a shared repository of photos that we can use and a style guide, but we're different. I, and I tend to say, well, that's really interesting because when we all came here from our various different departments, how many doors did you all go through? And they're like, oh. and where were the doorknobs? Like, well, they were all here. It's like, well, why? You're different. Why don't you put your door no, on the ceiling, but make it transparent? But well, that's stupid. Everyone knows that a doorknob is there. It's like, yeah, right. So you've arrived on a unified solution. Why can't you just accept that? I, I don't use that language because I tend to go a bit softer. That we've got evidence that shows how people are using our websites from the industry and everywhere else. There are simple things that you can do that make it easier for people to use your website. It's now a commodity that everybody's used to. Let's just, let's just start doing things in the same way. And actually, are you aware that if all these departments and colleges, and no, with no disrespect to agencies, because we do work with agencies, um, if they all went to different agencies and had a custom-built website, that could be 4,500 websites times anything from 20 grand to 300 grand, perhaps. That's a lot of money. Maybe we could save some by having a centrally reusable set of templates and a content management system that we then all use. We can train people how to use it, give them control, because they're different. They need to make it different. Uh, probably if they don't break it or get hacked. <laughs> That's the project. That got agreed on that basis. We got the money to do it on that basis, that it was reusable and we could show people, here's how much it would cost to do it if everybody does their own thing. So if you can make stuff reusable and easy for people to use it, I think universities would be interested in it. <coughs> so that's a lovely Gantt chart, which has got talking to the university, finding out what they want, making a long list of all the templates we needed, sort of forms, requirements, things like that. Uh, taking into account all of the other user requirements, and here are some of my favorites. Um, we must consider that there's no place on the internet for images, so that's good. We need navigation that would work to infinite levels. That was also in the spec. Um, what's the other one? I think those are my two favorites. The infinite levels of navigation was an interesting one because that was saying, why would we use a content management system that we can't just take our website from 2000 and dump it straight into this system? And so the designers and the content people were saying, this might be an opportunity to read what you wrote then and maybe think about rewriting it. Think about your navigation. Think about the fact that if people are navigating using phones, maybe search is more important than drop-down menus. But it, again, because it's a... Uh, a project, it, I don't see how it could have gone any other way. Because it's in an institution like that, you need to make a spec that has all of those different elements in it. And I think that is kind of where Drupal came from, to be honest. Because with the wish list of all the various different things that people wanted, there were very few CMSs that all of the different tech departments could agree would be able to deliver those various different things. And also the community aspect of it is also sort of, it seemed to have an ethos that chimed with us a lot. That said, that reminds me of the other bit in the spec. It's got to work on any content management system, the new template set, uh, and people need to be able to, to use Notepad as well to create their own websites. 
using the templates. Now, the templates are responsive, and I don't know if any of you looked at the code behind responsive websites, <coughs> but that stuff isn't built to be copied and pasted in Notepad. You can do, but it's very, very difficult. Essentially, we went, by which I mean probably about 20,000 pages, something like that. So the main university website, all of our research news features, things like that. We went with Drupal. So working with Leon, Bright Lemon, we looked at what had already been created in the code stack. And we're like, OK, <laughs> let's redo that bit. So because we couldn't work with a single content management system, it just meant there was extra work. I mean, there are other people from this university here. Are there any other universities here at all? No? OK. Uh, in the university terms, that's, that just, that's alarming for a place that needs to be careful about how it spends its money. So that was pretty, I mean, that doesn't represent how long we spent working on the actual Drupal bit of it. But from my perspective, it was pretty swift. It was a case of marking up the web pages and being really kind of granular about what's the functionality you need on each bit of this page? What's the author experience going to be like? And bringing all the web editors on board was made easier by customizing the user interface within Drupal. Because I said to them, they would be saying, how do we, how do we add an item here? And I go, that's, that's fine, you put it in the node queue. And they're like, what? <laughs> What's that? Because they've never used Drupal before. So we had to sort of think about even breaking the editors into the language of Drupal so that they could understand what. <coughs> the, the truth is, in the past, we didn't have a, an alternative. If we wanted to put something on the home page, like I say, we would have been emailing a file to someone. But that wasn't a blocker. We got some good training with them. And because the interfaces were customized with little text, <coughs> text blocks explaining what this particular bit of the system was for, they picked it up really quickly. And in fact, apart from a few days training at the beginning, we started bringing new editors in from around the university. And with some of them, they didn't even need to sit down for a training course because that UI within the editor bit, it had it all in there. And I was always, and this is the case with other systems we use, I think they've got to be, you've got to be able to log in, and if you've got to ask too many questions of it, maybe there's something that can be done to optimize the, the editor experience. So we've got a couple of hundred, 150 websites in Drupal, but they range in different sizes. So some of them might be a few hundred pages, other will be thousands and thousands of pages. And then we also have systems we also have websites in other content management systems as well. But they are a lot of those are going to be brought into Drupal. So I don't, will we, uh, yeah, like the, the Wix example, it's, I absolutely agree. And we are going to have examples in the university, we always will do, where somebody needs to fire up a website. And we have university websites on Wix.com actually, probably, um, because people have credit cards and they want to get stuff done. And we need to break down the idea that it's difficult to get help from IT teams, because it isn't. Certainly my experience, our IT team is fantastic. And we've been with Drupal now since 2012. Yeah. I don't think there's been anything from the, our communications team that we've thrown at them that hasn't been sorted out, actually. Um, but what we have found, again, like I say, is content areas that <coughs> need rewriting. And it's, we're no longer stressing about how we're going to get that rewritten. It's a question of who can sign off text that describes what the university is, that sort of thing. That's the problem, not how we're going to make sure there's a computer officer there that can update it. I'm just going to quickly whiz through some examples of the sorts of things we're putting out on social media as examples of things that we want to be on our website. And we are still perhaps finding that it's still a faster path at the moment to publish to a social media platform 
than the website. And we kind of need to break that culture somehow. The other thing, so comments are still important for us. If we're trying to measure success on Facebook, we look at comments. This is an article about the positive mental health benefits of listening to hip hop. And the great thing about that is that the comments were from people that had lots of experiences of positive mental health benefits because of listening to hip hop. The researcher has taken those Facebook comments and they are being used in her research. So that is social media success. We don't really care about the number of likes, to be honest. But there's some big numbers, which is nice. But the comments that show that we've actually been able to help societal change or give something back to the academic community that they can use for further research, going back to the contribute to society bit, sticking up a photo of some ducks, it, it, that is social media gold for us, but it's not really contributing to society. Well, I mean, the ducks, to be fair, they'll be eating various other organisms anyway, but let's not go into that. <laughs> this man here is lovely. He's written a, a book about the migratory patterns of cuckoos. Uh, we could have written a lot about that. But instead, I uh, met him at lunchtime. <coughs> Film this. Although it's the first day of spring today, you won't hear that cuckoo noise for another month because cuckoos are all in West Africa and they've still got a 3,000 kilometer trip across the Sahara, a non stop 50 to 60 hour flight before they get here to <laughs> greet our spring. I've been making this noise ever since I was a little boy. It's great fun to do. You cup a little a hollow in your hands like this, and you blow between your uh, thumbs. And I'm almost, almost mimicking what a real cuckoo does. When the cuckoo makes its noise, it opens its bill for the cook, and then closes the bill to make a sound chamber for the oo. And although this sound is our welcome harbinger of spring, a sign that the world is still working, for little birds, the cuckoo's call is a signal of doom because, of course, the cuckoo is nature's most notorious cheat, which is going to foist its eggs and young onto the care of little warblers and pivots who waste their summer raising a cuckoo chick instead of a brood of their own. Happy spring! <laughs> yeah. yeah, we put that out on the first day of spring, and I really like that dark... <laughs> lingering shot at the end. It's just a bit of a reality check. So I shot all that with my phone. Single shot, didn't need editing. Um, it went straight up onto Facebook, published as Facebook video, because if we put it on YouTube and embed it on Facebook, the algorithm will squash it. So I don't have a copy of that video in a system anywhere. It's on my phone, it's in the cloud, but it isn't anywhere on our websites and it isn't anywhere on YouTube. And actually now, if I was to publish that again now, we'd do a square crop for it. Well, I'm a film student, so I still can't quite get my head around a square crop, but I accept it, that, that if you're looking at it on the phone in either direction, you'll get a unified experience. And we would put burnt in subtitles on it, because most people watch Facebook video without listening to the audio. So even subtitles on videos, stuff like this, we now there's a lot more effort going into content creation to adapt a single piece of content for all these different social media platforms. And yet again, much like that list earlier on, the website is right at the end of it. Uh, we reuse a lot of content. Uh, that was World Maths Day. That is Suvi, who does brand advice and that sort of thing in, in my team. And that is an equation that describes how a ponytail falls. So there you go. It was research that was crucial research that was done many years ago and we just pulled it out of the out of the research journal, took a quick photo, put that on it and put it out on World Maths Day. Uh, that's Professor Stephen Hawking. And every now and then, much like Gandalf, we have content that, and ducks. And that's not to say that ducks and Stephen Hawking are on the same spectrum. This 
individual, he, sometimes we experiment with content to try out a new channel or a new way of doing things. And I, I, I keep saying to the team, that's fine, but always experiment with a low risk bit of content first. The first Facebook Live we ever did was with Professor Hawking, and we didn't tell anyone about it in case it went wrong. <laughs> but it didn't go wrong, and it, it, it went very well, actually. But we learned an awful lot in, for example, I don't know if any of you have done any Facebook Lives, but please turn off your orientation lock on your phone. Because if you have that on, and then you do a Facebook Live and you turn your phone like that, <coughs> the Facebook Live goes out at a 90 degree angle. Just, anyway, just, that's just a little tip for you all. <laughs> so again, we're having to learn how to reformat content every week, pretty much. And then Instagram. Here's a photo of a bench. Which is like, why have you done that? Well, because alum went on the Instagram account and they said, can you go and take a photo of this bench? We paid for it to commemorate the death of a friend at the college. So we did. It's like five minutes work. Why wouldn't we do that? And they absolutely loved it. They really appreciated it. So some of the content creation workflows we're dealing with now are see a comment from some random person on the other side of the world, run out with a camera, create something, put it out on that channel where that conversation happened. But again, I wonder whether there's somewhere on the website that could kind of pull all that stuff in. So we're making a lot of content decisions in our office that, again, the website hasn't, the traditional website hasn't factored into it, having engaging with that audience. There's going to be a bang. Science Festival. Um, oh, hello. This is a cinemagraph. Come on. It's kind of like a film, but you can define which bit of the screen still moves. So that's a kinetic sculpture outside the university library. So to create that piece of content, uh, Lloyd put a phone on a tripod, ran in, he was wearing, this is, I think this is an important detail, he was wearing a massive woolly hat with big bubbles on it. He ran from behind the camera, spanned that sculpture, and then ran back behind the camera again, which is why there's this lovely smile on the student's face, because it was a sight to behold. Again, that's another little bit of content that's been created that you can't find anywhere on the website. It's only on, only on Instagram. The media lifespan on Instagram is about six hours. So if you create a photo, it's kind of dead after six hours. It sort of falls behind. So again, we could probably get some more life out of it by putting it out on the website. And it looks like you've got lots of hooks for things like Drupal. But again, sometimes we're not quite sure what questions to ask or what, what is actually possible in the platform. So we're hammering away at all these social media platforms, and perhaps we haven't thought, how do we get more out of that using the main site? And then YouTube, we've got corporate films, films we make ourselves, smartphone films, student-made films, a 30-second film of a flea jumping. So this is like research footage. It's been shot in a lab, but we could reuse it somewhere else. Uh, so we, 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 I feel we enhance this by putting a drum roll and a cymbal <laughs> smash on it when the flea jumps just to give it a bit more meaning. It helped it get 66,000 views. <laughs> and then people ask questions about how does the flea jump. And we're like, read the description, because it's, <laughs> it's, that's why we've written the description. <laughs> but it was, a fair, it was a fair call, though. We've learned from that. We've learned from that. So we also saw a film on YouTube of uh, an airplane wing in a wind tunnel, smoke being poured over it so that you can test the show the airflow, show how, a, how, a, how flight is possible. And it had about, that also had about 70,000 views, but there wasn't really a description of what was happening, there was no voiceover. So for us, as a piece of content, we thought, people that are interested in this, there are comments underneath the film saying, what's going on, that sort of thing, and no, and no answers. So we set up this short series of films called Under the Microscope where we took footage that had already been shot in the university in different departments and then recorded a voiceover over the top of it and then put it all out on the internet. And I was trying to work out where would people go to find that content, again, thinking about the websites. And maybe this is why we do sometimes not think about the website, because people do still use search. So if they're looking for a particular subject matter, 
they might use Google or the second biggest search engine in the world, YouTube. And then they might find a piece of our content, engage with it, and then think maybe they are the right person to come to the university. They might not think to go to the university's website. Because that student might think, I'm not the right kind of person to go to that university, but I'm interested in this subject. I'm going to try and find it on YouTube. So weirdly enough, for us, sometimes the website is not a good port of call for some of the people we're trying to get to. They've already decided for whatever reason that they shouldn't look at our website. It's not right for them. So we tried to get to them from other avenues. That doesn't mean we couldn't reuse this stuff on our site. So with this, I thought if people are looking for tech articles, like popular tech articles, where do they go for that? I was using Flipboard at the time, which is just one of those kind of <coughs> aggregators. It makes RSS feeds or Twitter feeds look a bit more beautiful. And I just hit the science category and then wrote down all of the main media outlets that showed up when you looked at that category. Like breaking it down to where does a user go if they're looking for something like that? Oh, there's some beautiful nerds out there. They don't have to be beautiful. Oh, there's some great people out there who are interested in science. They've used Flipboard. They've clicked on science. What are they going to see? If they're not finding our stuff, they were finding lots of articles by io9. So we contacted io9 and said, will you carry all of our films in this series? And they said, yeah, sure. And they, they as a result, this next film that I show you, is successful in terms of how many views it's had on YouTube, the most successful video we've ha ever had on YouTube, and it now gets used in <coughs> classrooms and as part of learning materials and things like that. Uh, but it isn't on our website. Oh, hello. Is it even in my presentation? The green cell you see here is a killer T cell of the immune system which is attacking the cancerous red and blue cell. You can tell when the killer cell has recognized the cancer cell because the two dots move around and contact the target. The killer cell then spreads out over the cancerous cell. Passing the video through a filter makes the killer cell look yellow and allows us to really see how it focuses on the cancer cell. These killer T cells are constantly hunting down dangerous cells throughout the body and destroying them. I think it helps that subject matter is something that everybody, unfortunately, probably has some kind of connection with. But that didn't, apart from the Let's not think about the money that went into the research. From a communications perspective, that didn't cost anything to make. The music was knocked out in a lunch break. I played three chords on a keyboard and then slowed it down 400 times and then banged it out. I thought they'll probably like ambient music on io9. And again, I, we did have some web pages on the site for that story, but mostly the traffic and the engagement was happening either at io9 or on YouTube. That's just an idea of probably can't take photos of that. Is it <laughs> possible to? Oh well, I'll just skip past it. Though, if you can, if you can remember what those things looked like, <laughs> that's our content planning board. So in the communications office. All of the content that we put out through our website or our social media channels, we do all the planning in Trello now, which if you used it, it's basically like a big pin board. And I guess five minutes, great. Traditionally, people have stuff we need to do, stuff we're doing, stuff we've finished, so that they can show the stuff we're doing column to their bosses and say, we can't do that. <laughs> we use it to plan our content up to a year in advance, so we can say, here's the story, what channels are we going to put it out on, and who's responsible for doing that? So each one of those cards would be a different story and lots of multiple people associated with it. <coughs> and it would typically be website, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that sort of thing. So it's another system we're using to do the content stuff. And it keeps making me think what, like the phrase content management system, well, we are using 
as a comms perspective, I guess we're managing content across so many different areas, you know, Google spreadsheets, Trello, emails, pinging around people. And I guess that might be just because there are so many different channels that we've got, and we've got people working in different departments, or using different technology. So actually having web access to a single unified view is quite important for us. That's kind of how we've verified success in the past, which isn't <coughs> right. You know, have we got a verified account on Twitter and Facebook, which we have. Does anyone know what that thing on the right is? So that represents an alt metric score. So that's called the alt metric donut. And each color represents different channels that a researcher's research has appeared on, like the journal that they've published, whether it's had visibility on Twitter, Facebook, academic journals, websites, and things like that. And then they get a number in the middle, which tells them how visible their piece of content is. So that's what they care about, because if they get a big donut, it helps show the impact of their research, public understanding of their research. To be honest, they probably don't care whether it's on a particular website or not. So that's the other thing, is like a lot of the content coming out of the academic side of things, they need to get funding to continue their research and they need to contribute to society and show the impact. Whether the website plays part of that or not isn't necessarily something that they're going to be kept awake at night by. So we're more concerned with changing behaviour and making people happy, you know. And we will use any channel at our disposal to do that. And I guess it's been harder to justify putting so much effort into some of the central pages sometimes on the website when so many of those transactions with users have been on social media platforms where we can measure the engagement with them straight away. We can make fairly minimum effort to get that stuff happening. So that's kind of what we're competing with in a way. Um, and although this, originally this slide was really to show how we've adopted all of our social media channels, I think it probably teaches us a lot about how we've redone all of our websites as well, which is learn from what others have been doing, experiment with stuff, create some things, build it, show that it works. If it does work, train other people how to do it. If it doesn't work, ask them politely to stop doing it. <laughs> Encourage other people to do it. The social media guidelines are very much about Here's what you should be doing. We think it's a great idea. Get on with it. Not don't do that, 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 and that. And then reuse the stuff. So with Drupal, that means Jamie's team are doing this process as well. You know, constantly refining the way that they have a Drupal offering that they send out to the departments. Learning from the people. Learning from the editors. Learning how to make the site work so that when Stephen Hawking's thesis gets published online, and that wasn't in a Drupal site. Uh, it brought some web servers down. So we have to deal with those kind of spikes of traffic. And actually, we have had spikes like that with the Drupal stuff, which since Jamie's team have been working on it, I think we've managed to weather some storms, which in the past would have... I did have a call at one point from an IT team. Hi. <laughs> I just keep remembering about who might be watching this. <laughs> Can you stop... This is to the press office, essentially. Can you stop creating content that's popular because you're actually breaking our web servers. <laughs> <coughs> Which, that's my success metric, personally, but there we go. Uh, that's all I have to say. Apologies on YouTube to anyone I've offended. There we go. Any, oh, we're at two already. There you are. Thank you, Barney, for a very humorous and informative presentation. You're welcome. Um, one of my questions was going to be around, well, I have a question. My mm. question is, so you adopted Drupal in 2012, and it's now 2018. During those six years, how has the management of your websites in general and Drupal playing a part in that changed and what have those learnings been? So we no longer have a stopper which is going back to that we need to react within 15 minutes. 
something that happens in the outside world, we need to adapt a message, put it out there really quickly. We wouldn't have been able to meet that, quite frankly, before content management, before Drupal. There would have been too many potential stoppers. Just the fact that that's the way the place has been built up, to rely on hand code going into one thing and then something else, doing something else, something else, something else. We did have kind of templating age, um, engines running, but they were using some custom code or just they were kind of in-house essentially. So we didn't have to worry about that. We stopped worrying about how do we get something on the website and we started worrying about which page should we deal with next. So we have been focusing more on the content and stressing out less about, oh, have I got the time to try and work out how I can change that thing on that particular web page. I feel more comfortable now about going to the IT team and saying, can we do that, that and that? And I trust them that actually what has happened now is they will say, yeah, there are eight different ways we could do that in Drupal and that and that, rather than, no, it's not worth the effort. <laughs> Which was fair actually at the time because they did have to be very careful about how much developer time they devoted to arty farty marketing stuff. <laughs> So it just seems like it's a better relationship, really. That, that's probably what's changed. We've got a lot more content editors that are empowered to change content on very high level, top level bits of the website now, which we wouldn't have had before. So I think it's helped us think about how do you get things signed off, how do you get <coughs> stuff online, whereas in the past, because was, there was quite a bit of um, magic that happened out of our view. You just sort of trusted in the process. But I think it, it's, it seems to be a bit more kind of transparent now. You can log in and you can see how things are done. It seems a bit less obtuse. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Michel Mavelli here. Um, I was wondering, do you collaborate with other universities using Drupal? Uh, the Drupal team might, but from a communications perspective, yeah. we would collaborate with other universities about maybe communications campaigns and things like that. But at that level, we wouldn't necessarily think about the web platform. We, we would probably, at a campaign level, we would think about the social media channels, if we're going to print anything, who the audiences are we're trying to get through to, what the objectives are, how we're going to measure whether stuff's worked or not, how much money we've got. And then yet again, the kind of the website bit, I mean, people will come up and say, we need a website. And you talk to them and you say, what are you trying to achieve? And sometimes they need a meeting or they need a film or they need to, someone to do a tweet. So I wouldn't personally collaborate with other universities on a content management system, but that's only because I would trust um, Jamie's team to do that bit of it. I mean, I'd happily feed into that process, but... Yeah, no and how do you decide which update should go to which platform? Like, do you have, for example, a month they set something big to us? Can you Twitter and Instagram, for example? Yeah. And um, would you recommend software that, that other companies can use, such as Hootsuite or Buffer or those kind of things? Um, so we use all the native. We use all the native analytics things for our social media channels, and. For content choices, it's depending on what's the audience we're trying to target and what the messages we're putting out. So all of our student experience stuff, or stuff geared towards sixth formers, we would put out on Facebook. We wouldn't put it on Twitter because they're not using it. Or if they are, there's only a few of them that are. So we put stuff out on Facebook and Instagram, YouTube, all of our video. Twitter we would use for university statements, um, information about the research at the university, that sort of thing. So the channel choice is selected by our strategy for which channels we're using for which audiences and which particular messages. As far as the kind of things like World Maths Day, we don't piggyback on all of those just because of the sheer volume of them. I gave a presentation at the Genome Campus on Monday and I made a joke about we'd probably have to do something for National Peanut Butter Day, thinking I'd made it up. 
but then apparently that actually then happened two days later. <laughs> so it's like, it wasn't me. Uh, I think I'm being kicked off. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> I'll bet you go. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Barney.